After you've done that, Matthew chapter 7 is where we're at today. Matthew chapter 7. We're in this teaching series called Best Sermon Ever. Best Sermon Ever. Matthew chapter 7. It's titled The Best Sermon Ever. I've said this uh, for weeks now because Jesus preached it, not because this will be my best sermon ever. Um, But we'll just entrust the Lord to that second part. Uh, We'll we'll certainly trust the first part. Best Sermon Ever because Jesus taught it. Matthew chapter 7 is where we're at. We're on the We're on the end, near the end of this Sermon on the Mount, this great Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus calls the disciples, and uh, they're on the side of the Sea of Galilee, on the mountainside of the Sea of Galilee, and he begins to instruct these disciples. And uh, we began this teaching in Matthew chapter 5, but I want to invite you to turn in your own Bibles, and if you need a Bible, we have some printed copies of God's Word in the back. We'd love for you to take it, own it, read it. Uh, If you rather, again, digitally, you can scan the QR code in front of you, or if you're online, click on that link. There should be a link there as well to follow along with the Bible app. But Matthew chapter 7, the main idea today that we're going to press in on is treat others the way you want to be treated. Treat others the way you want to be treated. If If we just live this one principle out, what would our community look like? What would our world look like? This is a truth, by the way, that we have been uh, instilling within your children uh, every Wednesday and Sunday that children gather. We want to teach children to treat others the way they want to be treated. We see it in verse 12. Uh, It's known as the golden rule, and Jesus teaches this principle. It begins in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye. Verse 5, hypocrite. First, First, take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before pigs, or they will trample them under their feet, turn and tear you to pieces. What a text. I hope you're ready. Jesus begins, do not judge. And uh, I know this to be true that we all from time to time face the temptation, give in to the temptation even to judge other people, even though Jesus tells us to not do it. But even in the way that you might not say something or do something, there's still those thoughts that creep into our mind. They're like, whoa, where did that come from? You know, and, uh, and we're called to run from that. Jesus teaches us, what would it, again, what would it look like if the church just lived out this text. And this text really came alive in us to not judge. I read this uh, article this past week. We break this command. We break this command, verse 1. When we think the worst of others, we break this command when we only speak to others of their faults. We break this command when we judge an entire life by its worst moments. We break this command when we judge the hidden motives of others. We break this command when we judge others without considering ourselves and their same circumstances. Jesus teaches us this important principle. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. We break this command when we think the worst of others. And so when you want to think the worst, can I encourage you, church, to think the best? What would it look like to to think the best, not the worst uh, of others? Oftentimes that we we battle that, we face that, we're always thinking the the worst, especially if you uh, are more on the negative side of life. And I'm not calling anyone out or pointing any fingers, uh, uh, but but, but there are are some that, you know, really battle that. They, 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 they They gotta be careful what they're surrounding themselves with, the people that are speaking into your lives so you're not uh, influenced to think always the worst. What would it look like for the church to think the best? To think the best. Craig Rochelle says, our spiritual enemy wants us to assume the worst about others. 
our Heavenly Father wants us to believe the best about others. Church, let's believe the best. Let's believe the, the best. We break this command when we only speak to others of their faults. When we only speak to others of their faults. What would it look like in your home? What would it look like in your home if you spent more time speaking of the, the good things, encouraging, congratulating, uh, uh, rather than it was, it's always negative, only always disciplining, calling out the faults. Now, I'm not saying you don't discipline. Uh, if you know our home, uh, we got two beauty queens. I love them. Uh, but, but there's a, there, there's a, a consistent discipline. Uh, and I, but there's also, we also on the other side, need to make sure we spend time encouraging, make sure we spend time loving, make sure we spend time you know, giving big old hugs and just spending time with, with them. And, and, and we're missing this in our homes. We're missing this in, our, in the world. There's a whole lot of noise every time someone does something wrong. We break this command when we judge an entire life only by its worst moments. Can I encourage you to stop writing? Stop writing people off based on these moments alone. How many people we've written off because of the worst moment of their life? I'm never going to surround myself with that person. Now, there's times that you need to create, create some, some room and grow in Christ to be able to be that spiritual, spiritually mature person to come alongside and encourage. But that's not what we're talking about here. Stop writing people off based on the worst moments of their, of their lives we break this command when we judge the hidden motives of others. Let's stop acting as if we know every motive within people. Because we don't. We don't know every motive. We don't know every motive. That's why communication is so important uh, within your marriage and within your home, within the church. Because we don't know every motive. We don't know why. There's so many misunderstandings that if we just got face-to-face if we just got face to face and calmly talked them through and listened more than we do talk, so many issues I, I, I believe would be resolved within our homes and within this home and within, and within the world. We break this command when we judge others without considering ourselves in their same circumstances. Why do people do what they do? Why do people live where they live? What led people to certain conclusions and to certain ends or, or, or at least the points where they're at in this specific life? What led them there? Uh -huh. I am always blown away every time that I'm driving with my girls and uh, in these conversations that we have. You know your children are are. are Smarter than you think they are. <laughs> All right, can we just agree that? And they're listening to like everything, and they're watching everything. It, it's always amazing, and I love, I love even how the Lord uses my my children uh, to bring on certain conviction in my life, areas that need to grow, that I need to grow in my life. A couple weeks ago, we're driving down the road, and there's a homeless person holding a sign. Homeless person holding the sign. And uh, we've all seen them. In fact, how many, uh, well, don't raise your hand. How many, uh, uh, you can just think it, like raise the hand in your mind, uh, unless you want to, I guess. Uh, but how many of you, you know, when you see that homeless person instantly, you've written them off. You've written them off. Maybe you had one, one, you know, one bad situation where you were generous and then you kind of sat back and watched them. You watched them, you know, put all the money in their car, pocket and then like actually walk down the street to, to their hidden car, you know? And so it's like, I'm never going to give again. I'm never going to do anything again. Or, or, or someone refused the generosity that you were about to give. Someone refused it. Or, or maybe you just grew up in a household that was always this way. You were taught, it was like instilled in you that every homeless person is a drug addict or whatever the thing might be. And so oftentimes we battle when we see people and we don't see people how God sees people and we instantly cast judgment down upon a person. We don't know. We don't know the why the person has ended up where they're at. We don't know why your neighbor has ended up where they're at. And uh, I, just, I just want to encourage us, church, as a church, to not cast this judgment, but also to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God tells you to be generous, go be generous. When the Spirit of God tells you to pray for somebody, pray for them. When the, when the Spirit of God tells you to go sit, go sit next to a person and, and hear their story. Hear their story. Maybe like Peter and John, silver and gold, I have none, but what I have is the, the name of the Lord, Jesus. And you just need to spend some, spend some time with somebody and, and listen and, 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 and hear their story rather than writing them instantly off. 
And so how do we judge appropriately and treat people the way we want to be treated? Would you write this down? The first is believe. Believe that the standard of judgment we use will be applied to us. How do we judge appropriately? Because there is this form of discernment that we, we need. How do we judge appropriately and treat people the way we want to be treated? Believe the standard of judgment we use will be applied to us. Look at verse 2. What does Jesus say? Same standard, same measure. Do you see that? Same standard and same measure. The same standard. When our judgment in regard to others is wrong, it is often not because we judge according to a standard, but because we are hypocritical in the application of the standard. We ignore the standard in our own life. It is common to judge others by one standard and ourselves by another standard, being far more generous to ourselves than, than others. And Jesus warns against this. He warns against this, the same standard, the same standard. Stephen Covey writes, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their behaviors. We judge ourselves by our intentions. And of course, they're always the best intentions, right? And that's how we judge ourselves, but we judge others by their behaviors. We don't give them the benefit of the doubt. We don't extend grace and mercy to them, although we want all of that to us. <laughs> it's selfish. And we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap. When I sit with couples, often this is what I discover that this is going on and alive in the home and possibly it's alive in your home today if you're in the house or online with us. And, and this is a major problem within your marriage. You wonder why the marriage isn't closer, you know, tighter, why there's not more joy, why we're not on the same page. It's because you're judging yourself by your intentions. I intended to say this. I intended to do this, although it didn't say it like I intended it or didn't do like I intended it. But I'm going to judge you at a much higher standard on your behavior. Let's be careful. Jesus warns us against this, the same standard. And then do you see in verse 2, he says the same measure. What's Jesus talking about? A little bit of context. According to the teaching of some rabbis in Jesus' time, God had two, he had two measures that he used to judge people. The first was justice and the second was mercy. Don't miss this. Two, two measures, justice and, and mercy. Whichever measure you want God to use with you, you should use that same measure with others. You should use that same measure with others. How do we judge appropriately, treat people the way we want to be treated? Look to verse 3 and, and verse 4. Verse 3 and verse 4. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye. Would you write this down? How, how do we judge appropriately, treat others the way we want to be treated? Strive for holiness so that we can help others strive for holiness. Strive for holiness personally. Strive for holiness so that we can help others strive for holiness. The standard, the standard is that we are fighting sin. So we can actually see sin for what it is and be able to help others. That's the call in your life. I mean, you struggle. What, what, what am I here for? What's the purpose of this life? As a believer in Christ Jesus, it's always to help people. It's always to help people. And God created you. God created you with unique giftings to be able to help people. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 4. That each one is a gift to serve people. And it's never to hurt people. And sadly, there's times in, even in the life of the church that people are hurt. And oftentimes, they're hurt by someone that's been hurt. They're hurt by someone that's never settled a hurt. And maybe you're here today and you've been living with a hurt. And it's hard to help people because all you can think about is the hurt that you're experiencing or the hurt that you're holding on. And today, would you surrender that hurt over to the Lord? 
and, and allow for his healing so that you can help the people that God has placed in your life. Strive for holiness so that we can help others see, strive uh, for, for holiness. Strive for holiness so we can help others. Jesus uses this example. He uses this example. Uh, Ron, come on, come on to the stage just for, just for a second, man, just for a second. Ron to the stage, my man Ron, my man Ron. Everybody knows Ron. Ron isn't just like a welcome home team member. He's like, he wants to know your whole story sometimes. And, and so if you got time, tell him. If not, just shake his hand and say, say it's good to meet you, brother, and, and keep moving, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love this guy, man. Hey, would you uh, put, put out your finger here? Put out your finger, okay. Uh, yeah, I just, just want to make sure we have a little. Oh, that's a big, that's a big one. Uh, they, they're not even going to be able to see. It's okay. You have like three right there, but that's okay. You can't even see it probably with your glasses on, can you? Uh, so. So Jesus, get, I know it's, it's, it's small, it's small. Jesus gives this kind of a funny example as he's teaching this day uh, of often what we're trying to do uh, when we're called to help people. And he says, you better take care of what is in your own life before you can help someone else. And, and often, isn't this the intention? This is also the intention and the behavior, right? We're judging others by my intentions, although we can't see past what's in, in our lives. And so Jesus uses this example, uh, this example it's a super visual example, obviously, that, um, uh, hey, you better remove this. You better remove this before you can help this person. You better remove this before you can help this brother. You better remove whatever sin is in your life, whatever pride is in your life. You better remove it before. Uh, go, go ahead and put this up, by the way. Like, as, as, like right there, as close as you can. Can, can you get You don't have to take glasses off. I mean, he's all, he's all in. No, don't put it in your eye, brother. Um, we, don't have time. we don't have time for tweezers. But, but often, this is how we act. And sadly, often this is how the church acts. And Jesus is teaching, a, 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 this is a crucial moment as he's concluding, as he's concluding this uh, Sermon on the Mount. This is a crucial moment in the life of the early church that if we're going to really help people, we must take this out of our eyes first so then we can come alongside of our brothers and then take it out of, and then take it out of their eyes. What would it look like for the church to live out the, the scriptures, to live out the call of Jesus? Are you okay? Yeah, now I can see. Oh, you can see now. You can see now. Thank you, man. Thank you. Put, put your hands together. Uh, thank, thank, thank Ron for his assistance. His assistance in the example today. But, but this, is the, this is the example that Jesus is giving us. This is the example that Jesus is giving us. R remove Remove that sin. Strive for holiness. Grow in Christ Jesus. Grow in spiritual maturity. And then come along with somebody else that, that needs that, that help. But if we, if, if, we, if we jump it, if we jump it, if we try to help the person with the, while, while the beam's still on, all we're going to do is hurt them. I'm going to turn and just whack them. And, uh, and that doesn't help anybody. But oftentimes that's what's happening all, all around us. So how do we judge appropriately, treat others the way we want to be treated? Would you write this down? Believe that we have a responsibility to apply right judgment, to apply right judgment. This is what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, hypocrite. If you're with us a few weeks ago, I shared that the, the, the Greek word for hypocrite literally means an actor, literally means a, a stage player. And so all those that heard Jesus that day would have known exactly what Jesus was referring to, exactly who Jesus was referring to. He says, hey, don't, don't be a fake. Don't be a fraud. Don't be an actor. Remove the mask. And he says this, hypocrite. First, take the beam out of the wood of, uh, beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. We, we need to believe, we, we, we need to believe that we have responsibility as the church, as followers of Jesus, to apply right judgment. So when we take that beam out of our eyes, we see what's in their eyes. We see the, the hurt that's in them, the pain that's in them, the sin that's all surrounding them. And we come alongside of them with, with love and with, with compassion. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, sin, we may rebuke, but not if we indulge in it. Our Lord will not have his kingdom made up of hypocritical theorists. He calls for practical obedience to the rules of holiness. Practical obedience to the rules of holiness. How do we judge appropriately? Treat people the way we want to be treated. Would you write this down? Be discerning on who we engage and how we do it. Be discerning on who we engage and how we do it. You see in verse 6, don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before 
pigs, or they will trample them under their feet. Turn and tear you to pieces. Don't give what is, what, is, what is holy. Listen, not everyone will be willing to receive correction or wisdom. Not everyone. Not everyone is ready and willing to receive correction and to receive wisdom. And so we need to be discerning. We need to be a discerning people. Jesus says, don't give what is holy. There's a call for the church to protect, protect the purity of holiness, protect the purity of, of holiness. Jesus tells us, don't be judgmental, but don't throw out all discernment either. Don't throw out all discernment either. Jesus spoke in the context of correcting godly brothers and, and sisters. Godly correction is, is a pearl. Though it may sting for a moment, that must not be cast before pigs. Those who are determined not to receive it. Look to verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock, and the door will be open to you. Do you see this progression in the intensity of prayer? It starts with ask, then it's seek, then it's knock. Ask, search, knock. There's a progression. There's a progression. The first ask. Prayer is, is like asking in that we simply make our request known to God and everyone who asks, we see, receives. Receiving is the reward of asking. Receiving is the reward of asking. James chapter 4, verse 3. Would you write that reference down? James 4, 3 says, You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. The thing, the very thing that you're asking God for, the very thing that you're petitioning to him, that you're making your request to him. Can you honestly answer, will this thing, if God grants it, if it comes through fruition, will this thing bring glory to his name? Or is it just it's going to build my name? Is it going to be build his name or is it going to build my name? Is it for his glory or is it for, for me? We need to pause and consider as we're making these petitions, these requests, known to God. Will it bring glory to him? I see God always answers prayers. Maybe some of you are thinking you're starting to doubt. You're starting to doubt the conversations even this week. I, God's just not answering my prayer. And I always kick against that because I believe that God answers prayers. And now how he answers might not be the answer that I want. <laughs> and so then it lies some, some tension of, oh, I don't know if I really believe that God's answering my prayer because, you know, it's, he's not giving me what I want. But God always answers prayers. And there's three ways he, he answers those prayers. The first is yes. And we celebrate and say amen and amen when he comes through and answers it the way we want, right? Remember the last time? The last time he came through? Man, you were celebrating. You weren't over here crying. <laughs> then the second way is no. No, that, and that's when we're in crying. Uh, until some years later, we look back and say, praise God. Praise God, even through the pain, even through the, 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 the no. Thank you for what you saved me from. You ever considered that? The decisions that we all make in life? And so oftentimes, God answers with, with no, and it's always for your good and for his glory. When he answers no, it is always for your good, for my good, and for his glory. It's always. And then there's the third answer that, that none of us really like, but uh, quite often we find ourselves in that, in that place, and it is the answer of wait. It's uh, one of the hardest things to do. In the impatient world that we're living in, and the consumeristic world that we're living in, if I want anything, I'll go out and buy it. I got, I got, I got a credit card, right? <laughs> It'll hurt me later, but I'm, I want what I want. And so the, one of the hardest things to do is Wait. One of the most beautiful things to do in this walk with Christ is to wait. Waiting for his timing. Waiting for his provision. And so God always answers. 
Yes, no, and wait. First John 5, 14 says this. Would you write this reference down? This is the confidence we have before him. You and I as followers of Jesus have confidence in him, not in, not in you or me. We have confidence in him. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Anything according to his will. Jesus already taught us in Matthew 6, right? The model prayer. Jesus taught us how to, to pray your will be done. Why? Because God, we sang about it a moment ago. He's sovereign. He's over all things. He's, he's before all things. He's the creator of all things. We should be seeking his will because he knows what's best for our, our lives. And so God, your will, your will, your will. The second is seek. Prayer is like seeking in that we search and that we search after God, his word, his will. And he who seeks, what? finds. He who seeks, finds. Finding is the reward of seeking. Remember the last thing you, you lost <laughs> and you're, you're searching for it? It's here somewhere. It's right where I put it. It's never right where you, I mean, it's always right where you put it. <laughs> might, not, might not remember where you put it but, uh, or blame it on somebody else, right? But when you find it, oh man, how good does it feel? It's the progression Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I wonder, is there an area, we've talked about this week after week, focused on the attitudes of the heart. There's heart issues, and, and so to check our hearts, we need to be a people that uh, consistently, Lord, examine my heart, examine my heart, check my, my heart. And are we seeking after him with our whole heart? Are we living for him with our whole heart? Or we're just giving them what, what, we, what we want and, and, and holding on to what we want with our, with our whole heart. Then the third progression is knock. It's knock. You know that person, that last person that just knocked and knocked away and it's like, okay, you can go now because I'm not answering the door, you know? And uh, <laughs> prayer is like knocking until the door is open. It's knocking until the door is open. We, we seek entrance into the great palace of the great King, knock until the door opens. Entering through the open door into his throne room is the reward of knocking. And it's the best reward of all. Knock. Adam Clark said, ask with confidence and humility. Seek with care and application. Knock with earnestness and perseverance this past week the Lord led me to this text in Luke chapter 18 Luke chapter 18 you don't have to turn I would encourage you to write the reference down Luke 18 1 just listen now he being Jesus told them a parable a short story on the need for them to pray always and not give up Two, there was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, verse four, for a while he was unwilling. But later he said to himself, even though, listen to this, even though I don't fear God or, or, or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. She doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to the, what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping then will he delay helping them? Some of you are in a, find yourself in a place where you're crying out to God, you're crying out to God, you're crying out to God. You're bringing the petitions before him. Maybe you feel like you, you're worn out. Can I encourage you to, to, to keep bringing those petitions before him? Don't give up. Keep, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Be persistent. Be persistent. Don't, don't give up. 
Don't give up. Verse 12, the text closes with verse 12. Therefore, keeping in mind all that we've already talked about, therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus said this to call us to discernment and to encourage us to look for those hearts that are softened, that are ready to receive. And when we find open hearts, we can trust that God has already been working within them. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Stop judging. Start showing grace. Receive his mercy that is extended to us each day. Receive it and then give it. Be a discerning person. Seek God's wisdom. Grow daily in, in his wisdom. And as 1 Thessalonians 5 says, never stop praying. Never stop praying. Treat people the way you want to be treated. There's a prayer that I want to give you as a next step for this week. And I want to challenge you to make this prayer a, a daily prayer. It's short. Lord, teach it to me. Teach what? Everything we've just talked about. What your word says. Lord, teach it to me. Write it on the fleshly tablets of my renewed heart. Write it out in full in my life. Oh, what would it look like if we as the church, we begin to pray this each day. We begin to live out the call to love people, to serve people. Not just one week that's called love week, but every day that the Lord gives us breath that we would be constantly aware of the people that he's placing in our lives. That we would be aware that your circle is different from my circle. And there's people in your circle that I might never even meet. But the Lord's calling you to treat them in a way that they ask questions. What's different about your life? What do you have that I don't have? What am I missing out on? That's what the world should be shouting about the church. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I don't know what says, what's going on in, in, in your life and in your home. And I don't know what part of this message the Lord spoke to you. Nor is it my job to answer that for you. <laughs> my job is to be a messenger of the Lord. And so in the quietness of this place, in the house and online, would you take a moment to just say, Lord, what is my response from all of this? What, what area of my life needs the attention right now, needs growth? What is it, Lord, that, that you want to say and how you want to change me? What is it, Lord? Teach it to me. Write it on the fleshly tablets of my heart. And I might walk in your ways. People are praying all across this place. Maybe there's one here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. And today would be the day of salvation for you. Something's been stirring within you. Something's missing within you. There's a call for salvation that comes only through Christ and Christ alone. And if that's your desire today, would you call upon the name of the Lord with me right now? People are praying all across this place. If it's your desire to be saved and set free, you say something like this, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. 
You are the Savior. Today, I trust in you completely for salvation. Forgive me of all my sins. Today, I believe in you. You came to this earth. You died on a cross. You were placed in a grave. And you rose victorious for me. And so today, I trust you to save me. Fill me with hope and peace. All that is of you, I receive. Starting today, I'll follow you all the days of my life. If that's you, would you say, thank you, Jesus? We're going to sing this final song. and It's a new song for our church. I'm thankful for the words that remind me of the God that I serve, the God that loves me, the God that has called me, the God who gives me purpose. And I want to challenge you to consider these words as we sing to consider these words. Maybe there's some things that that are unsettled in your life and you need to settle them today. There's something that you haven't surrendered and you need to surrender today. If you're in the house, there's going to be brothers and sisters on both sides of the front here that would love to pray with you. Confidentially, they would love to pray with you. They would love to encourage you. Something going on in your life. I want to challenge you to step out of your seats in just a moment. When we start singing, step out of your seats and, and come. Allow someone to pray with you. Men with men, women with women. If you're online with us, there's, there's a host that would love to pray with you. Love to encourage you. Love to connect you. So Lord Jesus, to you be all the glory and all the honor. What an awesome God you are. May we not take this life for granted. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus as we move, as we trust you. And we say amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?